Welcome back to Psychology Applied to Work. This is lecture 37, Stress Moderators. Recall lecture 36, we started chapter 13. We talked about stressors and strain uh, at work. Uh, and that included, you know, what do we mean by work stress? We introduced occupational health psychology as a subdomain in this area. We talked about the basic model, uh, you know, stressors and strain with moderators. And we talked about stressors at work and we talked about strains at work. Today we're going to finish chapter 13 when we go into detail about stress moderators. So, you know, what do we mean by that? Um, we're going to talk about recovery and sleep as moderators. We're going to talk about work-life imbalance aspects. Um, and we're going to talk about burnout and we're going to talk about interventions. This should be a pretty straightforward lecture um, and not, to, uh, not too long either. Okay, um, recall the uh, model uh, on the right. We introduced a simpler version in the previous lecture. Um, here I've got you know stressors and their corresponding strains and then things that moderate them. I'm kind of simplifying this. Um, you know, in these cases that we're talking about stressors that, you know, demands at work that can threaten resources is like one aspect of a stressor. So um, we're not going to talk too much about, you know, challenge oriented stressors, sort of the positive stressors. We're going to focus mostly here on moderators of stress and strain where you actually, you know, where, where there's usually a negative association with the stress and the strain. So um, in this case, we're talking about um, uh, of stressors you don't like, um, and we're talking about um, the subsequent outcomes of those stressors as your strains and negative outcomes associated with it. And then with moderators, it's what are, what are those factors that can affect that stressor-strain relationship, either positive or negative. So monitors, uh, moderators are factors, you know, or third variables, um, and that, that effect, you know, which you could turn up or turn down, so to speak, uh, change the strength of that relationship. So um, that's that typically moderators are, are, are drawn in that way in psychological models. Um, but another way of thinking about that is, is maybe imagine that as like a amplifier um, that's in the middle of that, and you can turn it up or turn it down. Um, and you can turn it down to, you know, you can, you know, 2x, 3x, 4x, is, and it's getting worse and worse, uh, um, uh, where the strains really get bad for a, for a certain amount of stress. And then you can turn it down where it's like, you know, one half or one quarter, um, where you're actually um, 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 having a moderating effect and, and actually lowering the amount of subsequent strain for the stress. So moderators can be, can be good or bad um, uh, to, uh, to that relationship. All right, so um, they can strengthen, as I mentioned, um, they can, which is to say they can make the strain more likely or more impactful, more strenuous, I guess you could say. Um, but they can also weaken that stress and strain and make it less likely or less impactful. Now, cognitive appraisal here, and we mentioned that last lecture, this is a really important um, aspect of moderation, which is how do you assess this? You know, when, you, when you're looking at... Um, at uh, um, uh, at the stress, you know, that you typically do like a primary appraisal, like, hey, is this stressful? You know, uh, something's going on here. Um, this thing that's this, this situation, um, you know, you might not ask yourself this explicit question, but you typically do have some sort of uh, at least implicit appraisal going on, which you're effectively asking yourself, is this event stressful to me? And if you, if you identify it at some, le at some level of your consciousness, you identified that, I, hey, this is something, something's different here. Um, and, and essentially you're saying that's, uh, yes, this is stressful. That's where the appraisal comes in. Yeah, but it's okay. You know, it's, if it's challenge oriented or, ah, that's in my way, that sucks. I don't want to do that. And the hindrance related or, Ooh, you know, that's bad. That's, that, that, that's, uh, uh, that could hurt me kind of thing. Um, and then you might have a secondary appraisal, you know, which is, can I deal with it? Um, you know, and, and how you would respond to that when it's a challenge, like, am I up to this task? This would be really good if I can get this done. Or if it's hindrances, yeah, this is a big hairy thing in my way, you know, can I really deal with this? And then what are the impacts if you say no, you know, which it can create its own cascading stress if it means you're not going to be able to get a certain goal done or, you know, there's going to be consequences in your job. Um, and then um, the, the threat-related aspect of this, this, this thing's going to hurt me, 
you know, is uh, how bad is it? Is it going to hurt it hurt me? So the, your your internal processes have a whole hell of a lot to do with how you what your actual response is, and uh, and then what's the affective feel of that? How and in, in that regard, how how much strain actually occurs? Okay, let's keep talking about moderators of stress and strain for a while yet. Um, personality. Uh, 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 and, or, 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 you know, what are the individual differences in personality of people when they're under stress? Um, the, uh, some elements of the big five, um, can have a moderating effect. As an example, people that are highly extroverted or people that are really low in neuroticism, um, often that can be a moderate, uh, a, 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 a good moderating effect, which is to say people that are highly extroverted, they're more likely to assert themselves to deal with whatever's stressing them out. They're more likely because they're highly extroverted to seek out other people, affiliative ways of coping with that stress. And people generally low in neuroticism are people that are more emotionally stable, so to speak. They're, they're less prone to negative emotion or there you could look at their, their gain circuit isn't turned up as high when, so they don't get as negative, they don't feel as negative, uh, uh, negatively for a given type of situational thing versus somebody high in neuroticism. So both of those things hopefully make sense. You, you, to the extent that you can fight for yourself or find affiliation to the extent that you get wound up in negative emotion and the source of a stress, you know, the, the, how that would uh, act as moderators. And, and, and this high extroversion, low neuroticism, you could look at high neuroticism as a, as a moderator that actually could actually work as a gain to make strains worse. I and mean, sometimes people with low conscientiousness, um, that can be positively correlated, like under work, people who don't work, like to work very hard, um, and that are then under a bunch of work stressors, um, that can actually increase the likelihood of counterproductive work behavior for those people. And then getting away from traits a little bit and looking more like patterns or sort of type-like stuff uh, 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 for personality, at least personality-like things that have been identified in the personality literature, um, you know, that, that would have a certain, um, uh, uh, you know, pattern to them. And one is negative affectivity. And, um, you know, this would also be related, typically related to somebody who's, who's prone, more prone to negative affect, which is to say they're more prone to negative emotion, which is to say that they're higher in neuroticism, but it's more than just like highly neurotic. Um, but these are people that are uh, uh, with high negative affectivity. Um, you know, they're more likely in a given situation to experience negative emotion or, or, or negative mood state. They're more likely to dwell on their fa fa failures. Those types of people um, often will see increase in their counterproductive work behavior as a response to uh, stress. And then kind of the converse, there's people that are what's called hardy, you know, and a hardiness would have associated questions, uh, self-report or observer report questions to assess one's hardiness, which is, you know, again, a broader personality pattern and not specific to any one particular dimension of the big five. Um, generally speaking, people high in hardiness, you know, they have a lot, they feel like they have a lot of control over their lives. You know, they have their agent in their own life, they have a lot of self-efficacy, um, uh, you know, they generally, uh, you know, the, the look at, look at, uh, their life as something that they have enough of a control over, um, that, it, that affects how they relate to stress. So these people tend to be more committed to work. They tend to view, they're more likely to view change, you know, at work, um, and in some kinds of stresses as challenges, um, and less as, you know, hindrances or threats. And overall, that makes them more resistant uh, uh, to uh, to stress. Um, high people that with high with, have high job satisfaction, and people that generally have high skills or abilities um, related to their job, um, that can actually reduce the strain. That can make them more resistant to to, to stress. A lot of the things being equal at work. Um, and then then those view that who view change as a stimulation, you know, people that are more open to change. Um, that can be, make them less vulnerable to stress than those who are, um, more likely resistant to change. Okay. So one more slide here on moderators of, uh, stress and strain. So there's lifestyle factors. Um, and again, these can be good or bad. You know, you can, you can, um, respond, uh, to, uh, as a moderator is I'm going to eat more, I'm going to exercise more, um, or I'm going to eat healthy, you know, or I might, might like comfort eat or, or, uh, or stress eat, which isn't good at all, um, you know, but I might also try to deal with this stress um, w w w via smoking or, or, or even drugs. Um, so again, good and bad. 
um, control is a big factor here. So um, how much autonomy you have, you know, which is gets into the control of your own life, how much of an agent you are in your own life, uh, that definitely impacts your reaction to stress. I mean, it's totally tied to cognitive appraisal. I mean, if you, if you, if you have two paths, one in which you feel, you really generally feel like you're an agent in your own life and you have options and you have control or, you know, you generally feel like you're passive and things always happen to you. And now you got a big stressor, you know, how you appraise that situation um, is, 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 is signif- can be very much different based upon um, how, how you feel about how much agency you have. So having autonomy at work, you know, autonomy and mastery, um, you know, with accountability, nice balance. But I mean, if you basically feel like, yeah, I'm pretty much in control at work. I make, my, I make most of my own decisions. Now you have stress. Well, you have control. Uh, uh, you, you have autonomy. You, you have the ability to make some decisions that maybe can mitigate that stress, deal with that stress, um, add additional moderators to that uh, to that stress, um, and and generally that part of your overall cognitive appraisal will be will be less negative, um, uh, given that uh, that you're an agent in your own life. So hopefully that makes makes sense. And then support. You know, to what extent do you have social ties that are supporting you, and that include family and friends and and coworkers, or how is your supervisor at providing uh, support? Um, all right, and then talk about recovery and sleep as moderators. So when we're talking about recovery, it's good to, to slice this in terms of the what versus the how. You know, what you do for recovery, that relates to activities. You know, sort of circular definition here, but you know, what you do, it would include like active leisure things, like I'm going to go exercise, I'm going to engage in a hobby, I'm going to go outside, I'm going to spend some time with family and friends. Or it could be passive leisure, which I'm just going to chill, I'm just going to read a book, I'm just going to binge watch some show, uh, I just got to zone out for a little bit. Um, in, in both of these cases, these are activities you're choosing to do, you're acting to do these things, they're the what. Um, but you can look at them as either active or passive. And then the how relates to, you know, what experiences do you get from recovery? Uh, and that can be in like, what are you going to do? Whatever the thing is, but the how would be, I'm going to, I got to just psychologically detach from work for a little bit. I got to, you know, I, I've got to decompress here. So I've got to, I've, I have to have an experience here uh, where I'm going to care about something that, it's not about work, or I'm literally just not going to care about work for a while. Um, and that could be like, I'm just going to experience mastery about something. And, and I suppose in some ways this could be where, when work turns around, when you feel like things are going your way, or you just, you know, I am going to sit down and I'm going to get my guitar out and I'm going to get back into these chords. I'm going to play some good songs and I feel good about myself. So I'm going to do something where I have not only control over it, but I actually, I actually can exercise mastery. So whether work or not related, um, the, the exercise of mastery can give you an experience. Uh, you know, you can look at that as sort of, a um, um, uh, your, your feeling of control and your feeling of doing high performing, you know, you're setting yourself up so you can basically trip that, um, so that you get a state of mind. And again, a how, an experience of, I'm doing well, I'm high performing, I'm, I'm in control over my life as a, as a way to, to, to moderate the strains associated with whatever stressor you have, especially if you're like, if you're feeling overwhelmed and you can't get anything done and, and you're so stretched that everything you've done is, is terrible because you can't give it its, its full worth, just like settling out for a second and doing something really, really well can be a nice recovery mechanism. And then finding ways to just relax Find ways, again, relates to mastery to some extent, but just to find ways to just be in control. Um, in a, now, sleep is a obvi- an obvious type of recovery, and inadequate sleep is almost nearly universal a concern for, co- for workers. It doesn't mean that every worker has problems, but it's a, something that almost everybody that's in the workplace has some concern about, that, they're, how, that they don't want to have inadequate sleep. Another way of saying it is, is getting adequate sleep is a priority for people. Um, because lack of sleep can slow your reaction time, it slows your cognition, it can affect your mood, increase your d- 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 overall sense of distress, and it can increase accidents and, uh, and injuries. Um, uh, um, incivility, um, uh, you know, somebody that's just not treating you well at work, being incivil. A lot of demands at work, you know, you're working with a customer that's treating you like crap, 
lots of things can impact sleep quality. Um, you know, making time, you know, for recovery, just doing some of these recovery elements up above is also related to whether or not you get proper sleep. So sleep is a recovery mechanism for stress, but oftentimes um, you, you, you lose that the, sort of the recovery therapy of sleep when you're under stress. So doing other things to manage your stress to get a sense of recovery can give you, I don't know, a kind of slack, so to speak, that will finally let you get a good night's sleep or something better in terms of sleep quality than you have been getting. And then you can start tapping into the recovery powers of that, of this, of sleep. But sometimes it's a chicken or the egg thing. You know, you got to get to some kind of mental state in order to, uh, out away from the stress in order to actually, you know, engage your sleep mechanisms properly. So, uh, and these are things that, that, Maybe you've experienced, maybe you haven't, but you know, typically getting a good night's sleep is something that um, gets harder and harder as you get older for various reasons, some of them physi physiological. Um, but I would strongly encourage all, all, all of you as students, especially those of you who are, who are sort of traditional aged undergraduate students, um, quality sleep is, is uh, almost second to none. On, you know, if you're going to list of all the things you can hopefully have some control over that serve as, as, as a stress moderators, um, quality sleep is, is paramount. Um, not only that, you know, you're, in, you're right now learning uh, a course um, and your neuroplasticity is tied to quality sleep. You're literally your ability to, ta to, to um, uh, establish more robust neuronal connections associated with what you've learned, associated with associations. Um, in, in order for you to have better, better recall and recognition in the future to, to, to be able to pull up that information in a test, in context, when you're adding this knowledge onto future knowledge, um, just getting good sleep is critical to, to those sorts of things. Okay, enough about sleep adv advocacy. Um, work-life imbalance or just, you know, the work-life relationship or work and non-work type things. Um, you can have conflicts based on time, which is to say you've got various commitments at work, you've got commitments in the rest of your life, and there's only so much time in a day. And if there's too much competition or, and you're sort of unable to meet all of your commitments, that can be a, 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 a source of stress, a source of strain. Um, but learning to balance these things can be itself a moderator. Um, the uh, um, You can have... Um, you know, what are, what are called strain-based conflicts, which is where a, a certain thing in one part of your work or non-work life is causing an, a causing strain. Um, and that it can be so simple as, you know, I'm doing all this stuff and I'm fatigued. Um, but that fatigue is then hurting you in other areas, causing a work-life imbalance. Like you're, you're just, you're so stressed at home because you, you know, you have a brand new child and that child can't sleep through the night. Been there. Um, and that then is affecting your quality of sleep, which is affecting your ability to concentrate and have a good attitude and other stuff at work or whatever. Um, you know, that's one strain uh, coming in to another part of your life. Um, you know, one stressor in your, in this case, your family life at night is causing a strain that's then be affecting your performance, your behavior, your physio physiologically or psychologically or both, you know, in other parts of your life. So strain-based conflicts. And you get behavior-based conflicts, which is, you know, certain types of things you do at work. You have certain behaviors that are uh, acceptable, and then you have things outside of work where certain behaviors are acceptable. I mean, it can be as simple. I mean, we're getting a little off topic, but it can be as simple as um, I can swear all I want, you know, at home, but I really it's considered unprofessional at work. And then sometimes I get accustomed to those behaviors and it sort of bleeds in, and I have a foul mouth at work, and people think of me less professionally, and I have to be careful about doing that. Um, it's, you know, not, not exactly, um, you know, the typical thing you talk about was in terms of stressors, but, uh, um, it's related. Um, but overall here on this whole work life balance thing and Im balance and imbalance, um, figuring out where your boundaries are, you know, figuring out what is balanced to you, um, between your various commitments you make to your work and your non-work stuff, to your work and family, to your, to your work and your general life. Um, that really is important to lowering the impact of stressors, to lowering the strain effects, is establishing good boundaries, keeping everything in balance, recognizing when things are in balance and changing your behavior, changing your priorities. Um, all of those things are, are generally speaking very good stress 
uh, moderators. And then let's talk about burnout a little bit. So um, burnout is something people are probably generally familiar with the term. Um, to get into some definitions, burnout is generally a long-term thing, a deep long-term thing. You know, you've got chronic emotional exhaustion, you just sort of a disengaged cynicism, overall reduced uh, effectiveness. Um, it's not the same as occasional work stress. Burnout is just, you know, it's something that typically is slow to develop. It's also typically slow to go away. Um, and it can be deep and profound. Um, people just, you know, become less engaged overall in their jobs. You know, they're, like, they're more likely to be, you know, to have depressive symptoms, more likely to be irritable or just apathetic. It can actually, you know, if it just if it really goes a long time and gets deep, it can affect your self-esteem and affect the amount of energy you have. Your overall sense of, you know, self, including like your self-efficacy, what, how much stuff you can get done, how involved you are in your job. Well, this, this, not only does this hurt your career, does this affect your overall, you know, sense of well-being? It, 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 it results in direct economic loss to your employer as well. So some of the predictors of burnout that includes like um, work overload. You know, this this should make a lot of sense. I mean, if you have too much t too much to do and not enough time, uh, and it never goes away, that's a good recipe for burnout. But so is role conflict and role ambiguity. If you're just chronically feeling like the job you're being asked to do is against your values, you know, role ambiguity, or you just can't quite figure out what it is you're supposed to do and you can't get a straight answer from your boss. Um, you know, every time you try to think you're doing the right thing, you get scolded. And, um, when you th knew, when you didn't think you were supposed to do something, you're told, Hey, why didn't you do that? And you can't really make sense of it. And it feels like it's a moving target. Um, and then when there's just, Hey, I don't know how to get all this stuff done. And that should come back to, you know, um, you know, again, what stress is and, and stress and, un and, and uncertainty and, and how really at, at some level, um, anything that's stressful negative affect associated um can usually be tied to some you know i'm i'm have I'm, I'm i'm seeing uncertainty i'm having a hard time predicting the future in a way that gives me confidence to act and now i'm concerned um that i don't know what to do i don't know where i am i don't know what plan i'm on i don't you know i don't know if my future is going to go well and i need to make a change and that's this stress we and we have all these evolved systems um, to make us feel agitated and, and to get us off our butt and get us to do something different if we're seeing if we're seeing uncertainty in areas of the future that we're trying to go into. So when it comes to this sort of burnout, um, you can get if you you know chronically dealing with uncertainty in your job, um, it just I mean at some point there's, you could look at some of this as what's called learned helplessness, which is just you you, you just can't f crack this nut, so to speak. And at some point, you're just kind of like, ugh, you know, like uh, it, it, the wrong thing for me to do here is to continue to to push against these headwinds that I can't figure that I can't navigate. And I'm just going to disengage. And I mean, there's an uh, there's an um, evolutionary argument for why, you know, some animals have learned helplessness. And you can Google learned helplessness and things they've done to <laughs> not very nice things they've done to rats and that sort of thing to actually get to where they would take no action because they just couldn't figure out what could keep, what would, what would, they couldn't ever figure out the associations between their behavior and getting shocked, you know, for instance, that at a certain point, it's just, okay, I'm just going to shut down here. And one of the arguments there is, is, is if you, no matter what you do is resource depleting, no matter what you do, uh, continues to create these sort of threat things, maybe the best thing to do is just to be, just to freeze for a moment, just to do nothing for a while. And because you can't figure out the environment, the environment is full of threats and uncertainty and you, and you can't seem to get any kind of even low level predictive model about it. Why don't you just roll, curl up in the ball in the corner for a while and wait. And what you're waiting for in theory is for the environment to shift. Because there's lots of things in, the, in in our environment, including lots of people, lots of climate, lots of other stuff, um, and oftentimes, sometimes you just just hang out for a while, um, and then uh, at some later date re-engage, and you'd actually discover that the rivers flowed a little bit, and the environment's a little bit new, and maybe you can navigate this a little bit. So you can kind of think about burnout in that regard, which is just I can't do this, can't figure this out. This, every day is just nonstop chronic crap. And so I'm done, you know, 
and I'm just, I'm just not going to care. <laughs> I'm going to do the, you know, quitting at work thing or whatever, maximally disengaged. You know, what's the least amount of work I can do to get fired? Um, and that's, it, it makes sense, right? Because, because of somebody that's burned out is you, usually somebody that's tried really hard for a really long time. Um, in some cases, you get people that are like extraordinarily conscientious. They're, they're the hardest working people on the team. Um, and, you know, these things are so dysfunctional and, and, and they're always, they feel like they're at cross purposes, um, with, with, uh, with everybody else and everything else and that nothing they do actually has a proper effect. Uh, and even though they might be really, really hardworking people at some point, they just kind of go to I'm done. Um, and it's, if that happens and, and you're running the organization, you screwed up. Um, you know, if you, if your people are getting burned out, um, you're ta- you, you, you've screwed up severely. Um, you're either, you're, you're either helping make your organization really difficult to navigate, you know, you're sending conflicting messages or you've just made, you've just been unable to deal with whatever your organization is facing and that you're, 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 that you relied on your hardworking people for too long and too much. So it, it, I've seen this happen um, many times in many different ways, you get like a, your department gets overworked because you get, you know, there's more stuff you have to do. And the manager's like, well, we got to get this done. Uh, and then a couple people quit. And then you know, maybe the company's not doing so well, right at that moment. And doesn't have the funds to, 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 to fill those, those, those open roles. And it's like, well, we got to do more with less. And some managers, and this kind of gets back to leadership arguments, some managers will be like, well, we got to roll up their sleeves and do more with less, you know, which is we got to get all this stuff done. And I know we're down two people, but, you know, we've got to work hard and we're going to do it. And I'm going to work as hard as you, yada, yada. Um, You have to be really careful about those environments because you can't sustain them um, for a long time um, because you will burn your people out. And if you will, if you burn your people out, um, the recovery from that, um, in some cases can be impossible. Uh, if you, if you as the manager, um, have created sort of a sense of betrayal for your people, the recovery might not be possible unless you're gone, for instance. So, you know, burnout is to be avoided. If you're a leader, uh, uh or otherwise responsible for aspects of an organization and, and people are burning out, you're really screwing up. So, um, you know, be, be aware of what it looks like, of what early stages of it mean, or, or when certain people have been like canaries in the coal mine and burnt out first. And if you don't take action, um, you know, you're on a sort of a death spiral in that little, in that little hierarchy, wherever it's, wherever it's happening. And it can happen in a, you know, good organization and you just have a mismatch over here because the, this, these people had a few less resources and got more on their plate and the, and the manager or the manager above that just did, didn't have the, the, the strength or the awareness to say, no, we can't do this. And they didn't have the um, intestinal fortitude to push, uh, push back against their bosses who were saying, well, we got to get this done. So instead it was like, well, we got to get it done people. And the next thing you know, a bunch of staff is burnt out and that can be uh, within the culture of that little uh, hierarchy can be, can be really bad. So avoid burnout. It's real. Um, okay. Um, in, in, this should be fairly obvious that, uh, um, you know, too much work to do too much, uh, conflict and ambiguity, but that it's individual differences apply. So, um, some people are more resilient, more hardy than others. Um, uh, and so some people will burn out faster than others, given all the same cir- circumstances. All right. So let's talk about interventions for a, a little bit here. So, um, what can a company, what can you uh, do, um, can an organization do to try to um, you know, reduce the negative aspects of these, these uh, stresses and strains? So you can think of a primary intervention as something that you just, overall as an organization, we're gonna do X, and, we're, and this is aimed to help everybody. And the main one here is just find out where the stressors are and get rid of them if you can. You know, if, if a thing is a fix the air conditioning, um, don't over, you know, don't overload people's, uh, um, um, plates. Um, you know, what, what, what can you do to put policies in place or other things in place that just reduce the actual number of stressors? Can you think of that as a primary intervention? What can you do with your workplace conditions? What can you do to your job design? Can you do a job, re- job redesign across the board? Um, but again, you're seeking to eliminate the stressors. 
Um, another way you can do that, if you can't get rid of the stressors, um, you can reduce whether they become strains by incorporating recovery at work. And that's literally what a break is. But there's lots of, lots of different ways you can do recoveries at work. And then the secondary interventions um, would be things that would be applied just to specific people who, ha who are experiencing stressors or are particularly susceptible to, to stressors. And so in a secondary intervention, what you're seeking to do is reduce the strains. Um, you can do that proactively, which is just basically encourage things like lifestyle changes so that people have recovery better. People have their own moderators and, and they're less likely to be as strained in a given stress. Or you can do that reactively uh, which is, oh, I see that you're under strain. Let's talk about things like some cognitive behavior skills. Let's talk about relaxation. Let's maybe provide you some support. And then there's a tertiary element of it, uh, you know, which is, okay, we've got these, we had all these stressors and these strains. We've got some people that are really effective. We don't want burnout. Um, what can we do as an intervention uh, that, that can help with healing? And that's what things like employee assistance programs are for. Okay, that's the lecture. Um, nice short one, too. We're done with chapter 13. And so today we talked about stress moderators. Um, and we, in, we, we talked about how recovery uh, and sleep are vital. We talked about the whole work versus non-work or work-life balance issues. Um, and we talked about burnout. And finally, we talked about interventions. Well, next we're going to get to the uh, um, chapter 14, the second to last chapter of the book, and we're getting to, into human factors engineering. And there we're going to talk about engineering psychology. That, inc that includes like time and motion studies. We're going to talk about person machine systems. We're going to talk about displays and controls. And finally, we'll talk about human factors in other fields. Okay, that's the end of the lecture, and we will see you for the next one.